started. Uh, welcome everybody, welcome to Rethinking Farmland and Housing Ownership Through an Equity and Justice Lens. Thank you for staying through Saturday afternoon after lunch. Um, my name is Fran Miller and I'm a staff attorney at the CAFS, the Center for Agriculture and Food Systems, which is housed at Vermont Law School. And I'm really happy to be presenting here today with my friends and colleagues. Uh, Duran Chavis is with uh, West, uh, Virgi Central Virginia Agrarian Commons. He's an activist, a food justice person, and he does a lot more, and we'll talk about that. Um, Kristen King-Reese is an attorney in private practice and a community land trust expert, and we've been working together on agrarian trust matters for a few years now. And Sarah Holdeman is a staff member at Agrarian Trust. Um, today we're gonna talk about community land trusts holding agricultural land, and specifically the evolution of Agrarian Trust's work with the Agrarian Commons and where we stand today. I'm gonna just do a short intro and do a shameless plug for the resources that CAFS produces. And then I'm going to turn it over to Duran to talk about what he's working on at the local level. And then Kristen's going to talk with us about some of the opportunities for conservation land trust to play in this work. And Sarah's going to wrap us up. So we should have plenty of time to do Q&A and we want to have conversations. So I hope you all will have questions. We have questions. We don't have all the answers. I will say that. Uh, we're working it. So let me do a short introduction of the Center for Ag and Food Systems. We do have a table in the exhibition space, which will be up a little bit longer. So please come visit us and, and get our resources. There are more seats in the front if you want to sit down. Um, our mission at CAFS is we address food system challenges that are related to a wide variety of the food system food justice, food security, we work a lot on farmland access, that's what I do, animal welfare, worker protections, the environment, public health, uh, among others. We work closely with local, regional, national, and international partners to provide legal services that respond to those partners' needs. And we develop resources that empower the communities that they serve. Through our clinic and our research assistant program, we have students who work directly on projects alongside of partners nationally and really do some innovative work that spans the food system. So some of our projects, we're gonna talk a little bit about the Farmland Access Legal Toolkit today. We have a healthy food policy project, which is a database for policymakers that includes policies on the local level that help incentivize healthy food in, in the cities in particular, but also in rural areas. The Farm Bill Law Enterprise is a consortium of law schools, including Vermont, that works on Farm Bill policy, and we produced a report on equity and governance in the Farm Bill this, um, this year, and as some of you may know, the Farm Bill is being hotly debated right now, so, there's some good resources on that site, it's farmbilllaw.org. And then we produce resources, and so we have a, a guide to current use taxation for ag lands, which is pretty in the weeds on ways people can get tax breaks on their land if they're farming, putting it in, in agricultural use. And then the Healthy Food Policy Project has a lot of issue-specific briefs, and this is just one that came out recently towards equitable and just food systems, and it looks at some of the definitions that are being thrown around about these things and where, what, what they mean, what does equitable and just food system mean, where are those definitions coming from, et cetera. So today we're gonna dive into some resources and, and discuss agrarian trust, which is, is um, on this legal toolkit, and this, Toolkit, for those of you who work with farmers, 
it's, it really has great information for farmers about accessing land, about leasing and land trusts and conservation easements and succession planning. Um, there's even a lease builder called the Farm Lease Builder and you can put in your information and it spits out a lease. You have to take it to a lawyer because leases are state specific, but um, it does give you something to work with. So, obviously, probably many of you are from land trusts. And you may not, might not need this page, but people that you work with might need it because they don't know what a land trust is. Um, this is just a really basic information about what are land trusts, what kinds of land trusts are there. Um, and today, we are focusing on this kind of hybrid, which Kristen is going to talk more about a community land trust holding agricultural land, and that's what agrarian trust is creating. Um, I'm going to call it AT, so I don't have to say that every time. Um, AT is really working hard to support local communities to create agrarian commons across the U.S., and those agrarian commons are local land projects. Um, AT's mission is supporting land access for next generation farmers. Um, and there's a whole lot of things that go with that. Um, I want to just give a little bit of background because it's important to give credit. Not enough people do. The practice of tending land in community rather than in private nuclear family ownership has been happening for literally thousands of years by indigenous communities who stewarded land around the world. It is not a new concept. In terms of farming collaboratively and cooperatively, the African American community has made unique leadership contributions to the development of farm cooperatives. And for a really good book detailing that history, look at Monica White, Freedom Farmers. It's great history on that. Finally, AT has been working to develop this hybrid land trust between conservation and community land trust. And as I said, Kristen's gonna talk about this, but for now, know that civil rights activists Charles and Shirley Sherrod and their colleagues built the first community land trust in the US. It did hold agricultural land and it had housing and schools and was tremendous. Uh, it was almost destroyed by the KKK and by USDA discrimination, but they have been able to rebuild, and although I don't think they're any longer a land trust, they do continue to steward land in Georgia to this day, so look them up. All right, on to agrarian trust. So, AT was formed for a bunch of different reasons, and by the way, I don't really have any more slides. <laughs> so this is gonna get stuck right here for a while. Um, not my thing. <laughs> uh, all right, so AT was eager to acknowledge and try to do some reparation work around this country's painful history of land dispossession and genocide. Farmers cannot afford land in America right now. Land access is the number one barrier to farmers being able to farm. Farmland ownership continues to consolidate 98% of farmland is owned by white people. Institutional investment in farmland more than doubled in the last 10 years, and financialization of farmland, making it an investment, kind of like a commodity, is through the roof. Um, American Farmland Trust is probably best at like, quantifying and repeating the immense development pressure that keeps good agricultural land at risk and now there's also competing and also important energy development pressures as well. So all these things are happening and have been happening for some time. And in 2014, one of AT's founders organized a group of 30 plus farmers and farm service providers to get together and talk about land access and talk about these issues and try to figure out what the hell to do. It was a diverse group, um, 
and eager to raise all of these issues that I was just talking about nationally, get national exposure and try to get USDA to do something and s see what could be done. And so they developed this model of agrarian trust. And these were activists and they were lawyers and they were really people trying to think outside the box. And they organized this national nonprofit, Agrarian Trust. And it's, uh, you know, when you organize a nonprofit, you have to file it at the state level. So they filed it in California. And then you file for tax exempt status. And you have different options for what kind of tax exempt status to get. And Agrarian Trust filed as a 501c3, which allows most land trusts are organized that way. They're charitable, educational. You can get. To, uh, contributions and people get deductions and so that tends to be what most people do. The original theory, the kind of theoretical model is that Agrarian Trust would be a national C3 nonprofit and that there would be these local projects around the US that would also be nonprofits. They would be organized as 501c2s, um, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and, and on each local project, there would be multiple farmers farming, and they would issue long-term leases to these farmers. So it would get at the issue of farmers not having access to land, because they would get 99-year leases, and so there would be secure land tenure, but then also the high cost of land. So farmers wouldn't have to buy the land. They could get a low lease rate and be able to hopefully make a few dollars that way and perhaps build equity in structures, in houses. And Kristen will talk more about how that can work with community land trusts, ground leases, where people own the building but they don't own the land. So this is the original thoughts. The thing is that 501c2 organizations, which were how the local projects were gonna be organized, are very limited and they can't engage in charitable activities, and they can't do education, and they can't do food justice projects, and they can't do all the things that some farmers want to be doing. So all they can do legally is hold title to the land, manage the property, negotiate leases, collect rent, engage in those kind of property management administrative type of activities. And also, importantly, they're always a subsidiary organization, and they're subject to some level of control by the parent nonprofit, which in this instance, Agrarian Trust. So this is the theory, and AT staff begin collaborating with people who wanted to do something different, who wanted to build these local projects. Um, local land projects where a nonprofit would own the farmland, provide long-term leases, take the land off the market, and take away those barriers to land access, especially for historically marginalized, marginalized farmers, black and brown farmers, is without wealth. Um, and the staff help these local projects file for nonprofit status for about a dozen agrarian commons in the US in 2020. Some of you might have been to other presentations at other rallies where the former executive director talked a little bit about this. So the work continued, some land donations came in. Um, the AT and the local projects fundraised for additional properties. I, there are currently eight, seven or eight, local land projects that own land across the US and these projects have worked really hard to build their local boards, including local farmers and activists like Duran. If you've ever been on the board of a newly formed project that's trying to do something different than the norm, you know it is not easy and it takes lots of conversation and struggle and they've been working it. So where it's come to now is that these local boards don't necessarily want to be controlled by the national organization. And although in the original vision of AT, the farmers were more focused on farming and they didn't necessarily want to deal with the administration of a nonprofit, the actual local projects that were created 
and the local farmers who are interested in, in doing more than farming. They're feeding their communities. They're doing all kinds of land and food justice work. They're creating educational opportunities for the community and for other farmers. And that's just the beginning. Duran will say more about what, what his project is doing. And I'm not going to get deep into this, but the prior leadership of the National AT was not especially transparent. And it was not clear to the local projects how decisions were getting made and who was getting fundraisers and other financial support. And the local projects had no insight into AT's governance process. Now AT is changing that, is reorganizing as we speak. Just hired a couple of co-interim executive directors who are diving in and figuring out what needs to happen. But some bad practices at national impacted how the local projects felt about being controlled by that national organization. So the question now is how can we evolve this model to accommodate what's actually built on the ground? We think there's tremendous opportunity here to both keep developing the local projects and build new product projects. Um, actually, I forgot to put this in my notes, but AT has been tentatively awarded uh, this recent USDA grant that's increasing land access and it's a lot of money and there's a bunch of new projects in there. So we're working on that. Some of these local projects are going to form their own 501c3 nonprofits and stay within AT's orbit in some way. We're figuring that out. Some of them are going to go with the original model and be a C2. They don't mind the control issue and feel able to build trust again. Uh, and Kristen and I, with help from others, some in this room, uh, have created a useful chart that compares different entity choices. So if you want to get down in the weeds on the legal issues, tell me and I'll, I'm happy to share that. Other questions that we're grappling with at AT. How can we evolve to use our privilege to support getting land back to black and brown communities? What's the support that the local projects need, whatever entity they create? from the national organization. This is more generally, and this is for all of us who work in predominantly white institutions, what's our role in reparative justice work? We haven't figured this out, um, but we are in a learning process, and happy to be here sharing with you all. So I'm gonna turn it over to Duran, who is going to give us some flavor on his project. Just do that. Oops, I forgot that one. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just want to echo, uh, I'm super hyped to see a packed house. Yeah. This is dope. Um, so yeah, my name is Deron Chavis. Um, uh, I am the founder director of an organization called Happily Natural Day. I'm also a founding board member for the Central Virginia Agrarian Commons. Um, my arc of work um, with the Central Virginia Agrarian Commons is I've been in this conversation since the beginning, right? Since uh, the initial conversations. So today I'm just going to kind of run through a little bit about what that work has looked like uh, for us. Um, it's been about a three year, I think, like a, at least a three year process, uh, but there's a little bit more that comes before that. So. Um, this uh, allow me to reintroduce myself a little bit. So um, I'm a native Richmonder. I was born on the south side of Richmond, Virginia. Um, those who are aware of like this country's history with settler colonialism, you know that Virginia is ground zero for this American experiment of dispossession and uh, land extraction, right? Um, the part of town that I grew up on um, is, uh, uh, has been disinvested in and benign neglect. Um, during the 70s, the south side of Richmond was uh, annexed uh, into the city to dilute black political power 
uh, in the city, right? So great migration is occurring all across the country. Black people are moving into cities. In Richmond, Virginia, they're moving predominantly into South Side. The powers that be saw this mass influx of black folks and said, oh my God, they might be able to take over the government. And uh, so they said, okay, we're gonna annex a whole nother part of the surrounding county and bring it into the city of Richmond. So, you know, really, you know, nefarious gerrymandering, gerry gerrymandering before we knew that term. But um, uh, it resulted in the city going to the Supreme Court, like activists in Richmond, Virginia took this shit to the Supreme Court, ended up winning. Right, so the city of Richmond can no longer annex any new property into its uh, proper. So it's 60 square miles. It has to stay 60 square miles as a result of this, you know, uh, this 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 ish. Um, growing up on South Side, you know, because of that benign neglect, also because of redlining, you know, we experience those systemic aspects of racism that we see. You know, urban heat island effect is major issue and formerly redline neighborhoods, you know, it's literally hotter. My homie uh, had these, uh, what do you call it, thermo temperature gla goggles, you know what I mean? Maybe like three weeks ago, it was like 90 something degrees in the city. And the side of town that I'm from, like, he had the goggles pointed at the ground. It's 130 degrees in the hood, right? When we go to like the West End, which is the more affluent white part of the city, you know, this is where Monument Avenue, if you heard about like all the shit that was going down with the Confederates and they took down the monuments, all that shit is in the West End, right? Where the white folks stay. You go over there and put the thermal glasses on and it's 80 degrees, you feel me? So, you know, that's just one aspect. Of course, you know, food access is affected. It's also the same maps with the mass evictions that occurred during, you know, not only the post-pandemic, but even subprime lending back in 2008, and you know, I can go on and on and on about the intersectional inequities that these communities face. So that's my cauldron, right? That's, I'm, I'm born on the South Side, I'm living through these experiences, not really understanding what is going on, but I took my first job at the Black History Museum and Cultural Center to understand, right, what was going on in my own community. And it was through my uh, volunteering at the Black History Museum that I was able to found an organization called Happily National Day. It was actually a festival uh, that we did, launched um, during the, board of, uh, the 50th year anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. In that festival, this black liberation space that we created, we were blessed to meet black farmers. They came into the space selling produce and things like that, and they became my OGs, like elders, you know, wise counsel, right? They took me under the wing and you know, help me understand the importance of food security, right? And also help me understand a lot of the issues that have been happening around discrimination with the USDA, and et cetera. But our initial work you know, was doing this festival every year, and then we started working with the farmers, selling produce in community, right? Literally connecting those black farmers to formerly red line neighborhoods, selling their produce on their behalf, right? Um, these guys were in there, I'm probably like at the time, like 25, 26, something like that. These are men in their 60s and their 70s that are driving, you know, 400 pounds of produce into the city every week, right? And I'm, I'm kicking it with them on a Saturday in the middle of the park or at a community center trying to get these vegetables off. So of course you're gonna talk about, you know, farming, if you were with with a, with a elder farmer, right? Um, and then those conversations, I started feeling a little guilty because, you know, I have, at that time, um, this is not the case anymore, I had a relatively good back, and you know, these guys were a little older, you know what I'm saying? So it was like, yo, if something happened to you, you know, this whole program basically go to shit. So I started to be like, yo, I gotta start growing some things, you know what I mean, that's sustainable, to make the program sustainable. Um, at the same time, I worked at social services. I was the food stamp guy. So, you know, when you wanted to get Medicaid, uh, cash assistance, emergency assistance, I the guy that you sat in front of, right? And I did your interview. So I'm like, okay, uh, we want to do these gardens, we're selling these produce, we're doing these um, CSA shares. I need to go and create a space that we can start growing some stuff. So that's where my story starts in this urban ag space. First selling vegetables uh, on behalf of black farmers and then developing green spaces on my own, right? So. 
Yeah, that's kind of the roots of my story. Um, our organization currently manages eight urban gardens and farms across our region. Uh, pictured here is Sankofa Community Orchard. It's a five acre uh, uh, demonstration. Uh, we call it a food justice and climate resiliency demonstration. At Sankofa, we uh, not only grow food, uh, we have like a, uh, over 120 fruit trees that we planted in this space since COVID. I mean, we started working on the, on the project January 2021. Uh, but we also provide training. So we run a fellowship, a 12-week uh, a 12 week course, and a five-week boot camp. And so my goal with this work has been, yo, we need to grow more growers, you know, because, and they need to be from the communities that are disproportionately impacted by lack of access to healthy food. So I'm literally in the hood like, yo, we need to have control over our food system because the grocery store ain't coming, right? I mean, I don't know which I know about food access stuff, but the grocery store don't want to go in the hood because they're not gonna make no money, right? Um, and then there's some, you know, the reason why they're not gonna make no money is all this other stuff that has happened in the past, right? So uh, our conversation is like, well, what did communities do before there was a highway or refrigerated trucks? Right, because this is a recent phenomenon, right? Was a uh, uh, refrigerated truck is like 1930 something, right? And the highway is 1950 something. So before 1950, did people eat food? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so if the answer to that is yes, well, how did they get food? They were proximate to their farmer, right? They knew who they were. Everybody didn't, everybody wasn't a farmer. But everybody knew who the farmer was, right? Because you, either that guy is bringing the food into the city, or you live in a peri-urban situation, and you know you, you're able to connect like that. So essentially, um, my story with this work is, you know, one of the challenges of trying to establish that black-owned and controlled food system in Richmond, Virginia. Okay, and along with that is, you know. Issues of land tenure, right? Uh, the challenges as a beginning farmer trying to start a new farm. Anybody that farms knows that you need at least two years, to at least three years, to get your soil right, just in terms of growing something consistently. And then, of course, you know, you got to get your practices, what's your standard operating procedure, you need to get your infrastructure, your tools, equipment, and all that shit. That shit don't just come when you start, you know what I'm saying? So, um, you know. Along the way, we've started farms that got hit by the pressures of development, you know what I mean? The owner would be like, yo, um, this is dope. Y'all cut the trees down and kind of cleared the space, but you know, I'm about to slang this. You got 80K? Mm -mm. And like, man, work. I mean, I ain't, ain't got it in a mattress. I mean, I want to keep going here, but I ain't got the kind of bank to, you know, the, to, to, to check this, uh, this, this type of pressure. And then also like Shady, owners that want to up the, up the rent after a year or two. You know, I had one guy, we cleared the whole site. Um, he was on some old handshake shit. It was real cool and thought it was, everything was good. And as soon as he saw us getting a little grant money, he was like, yo, I want $600 a month for me to farm on this property. I'm like, man, you crazy. That's, that's an apartment. Like, you know what I mean? I, don't, I, can't, I can't live here. I mean, but anyway, um, so that's the phenomenon that I experienced. And so our work now today has been about how do we create wide runways for uh, BIPOC food system stakeholders, activists, urban farmers, so that they can have access to land and not have to go into debt trying to farm, right, or trying to establish their food-based business using this local food stuff. Um, yeah. So um, that brings us to the Central Virginia Growing Commons. So been doing this work, bada bada boom, right before COVID hits, uh, there's a conference in Richmond, Virginia, uh, the Biological Farming Conference. And any of y'all that farm know that those are pretty white spaces. You know, if you're a black person in the middle of like a urban, uh, inside of a uh, ag conference, regenerative ag conference, you're probably like one of the few people in that space. So we saw the Agrarian Trust there a couple years in a row. I, I used to be on the board for that organization and all that type of stuff. But um, you know, just made a mental note. Oh, this is an organization that's trying to remove land from the real estate market. Okay, cool. I didn't really see how that 
would connect with me because I'm like, I'm in the city, you know, I, I, I just didn't see how it connected. But later I would join a, a community land trust board and so I could understand the concept of a nonprofit organization holding land to make sure that press this new direction, right? This idea of trying to get black and brown people access to land. So I was like, oh, ears perked up. I've lost land. I've, you know, been kicked off of land or whatever. So these guys is talking about buying land and giving it to black folks. I'm all ears. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, took the contact information from them and, you know, put it in my back pocket. At the same time, there was a white woman from rural Virginia, Amelia County is about an hour away from Richmond. Uh, her name is Callie Walker. Callie is one of those Presbyterian, Quaker women, you know what I mean, <laughs> social justice-esque, but she's also like a preacher. She had no kids, and her and her husband living on this land, they were like, yo, when we pass away, we want to give this land to a black farmer. I was like, word, okay. <laughs> But no, nah, but I was like, word, but how, right? Yeah. First, you know, how do you make that decision? Like, you just, you know, roll up on a dude and be like, yo, you want to farm? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was like, this is crazy. Um, so, uh, she's in the workshop too, right? And so she says, you know, she, she connects with the people too. She asks her questions in the space. You know, it's an older white woman, so I was like, yeah, this is crazy. Um, <laughs> later, I call the folks from the Grain Trust like, yo, I heard y'all said y'all was really about that life in terms of like giving land on some reparative justice stuff to black folks. Like, what up? I mean, like, I think we can make something happen. I'm on the board for Community Land Trust here in the city. Like, what's up? How can we make this work? And they was like, yeah, but and Callie Walker was at the meeting too. She has these 80 acres that she's trying to donate. Like, how can we put y'all into conversation? Um, so I was like, yeah, oh, I'm, I'm down the ride on this. Let's see what's up. And what happens is that we get on a conference call and the decision is made that we will form a C2 in the beginning that we will collaborate with the Agrarian Trust and do this thing. So um, from the jump, our goal was to address issues of land access and tenure for black farmers in urban as well as rural spaces. I'm an agrarian but I grew up in apartments, you know what I mean, in the city. So I don't have a reference point for like, I'm gonna go out in the rural Virginia and just be off the grid, like that's not my reality, right? I, I, I know public transit, you know what I'm saying? I know I catch a cab, like where I need to go. <laughs> I ride a bike to where I need to go, I'm good, right? We had intense debates in the early stages of this about like, okay, we need, everybody needs to get out of the city and become more agrarian. Tough conversations, the reality for me is, I know a lot of black people that ain't going to, ain't going back to rural uh, anywhere. And where I live at, you know, um, rural is like Trump country. You know what I'm saying? So you go down the street, you know, they got Confederate flags, you know, you will not take my guns. You know, Trump is being railroaded, all this stuff on the, on the side of the road. So it's like, yo, I don't even want to be out here after dark. If our car break down out here, I'm, I'm shook, you know what I mean? So we were very clear that we needed to create systems of connectivity between farmers, black farmers in rural Virginia, as well as aspiring black farmers in urban um, space and just building these systems so that, you know, there's the, the market is in the city, right? So, you know, have space in the rural, so how do we get the space that's in the rural with all that scale and production that could be done, get that stuff into the city, and specifically building these black-owned systems. Um, like I said, we started with the C2 deal, but we were a little bit more sophisticated, you know, even in our conversation, the first people that were on our board, our, everybody basically either ran a nonprofit or had been farmer for years. So we didn't really need a lot of support. What we did need was that proximity to whiteness and wealth. You dig what I'm saying? And that manifested early in the work. We were like, yo, y'all gonna buy some property? I'm looking, right? Found like four or five places, we chose one. They started their fundraiser in June of 2022. Uh, they put the, the uh, purchase uh, uh, option on it, 20K, uh, for a farm in Petersburg, Virginia. Um, 
and in two months raised $220,000 for a purchase that would, uh, for the value where the land was sold at 160. So we had like another 60K that we used to uh, do farm development. At the same time, Agrarian Trust assisted with the legal work necessary to get the land transferred from Cali Walker. Because you know, that's surveys, it's fees and all that type of shit. They did all that, you know what I mean? So September 2022, now we got 85 acres, you know what I mean, in the, in the Central Virginia Agrarian Commons as a, you know, act of reparative justice. So, um, so the 80 acre uh, land donation, again, uh, our mission as an organization is to redistribute land to black and brown food system uh, stakeholders. So uh, our first thought was like, yo, we got 80 acres, boom. What are we gonna do with this 80 acres? Um, it's a lot of land. I don't know if any, well, y'all probably, y'all know. <laughs> <laughs> All y'all know, like, acres and shit. Like, I was like, I went on 10 acres. I was like, shit, this is a lot of fucking land. <laughs> but 80 of them bad boys was a, whoa. So, um, so we said, all right, well, we're going um, we're gonna to definitely make sure that this land is broken up and folks can get a plot, one to three acres. Um, the issue was, okay, well, how do we get people on the land, like, you know, you get them proximate to it. So we try to change up the zoning. And this is when we found out this is Trump country for real because the white folks came out in droves. I mean, like a line out the door to be like, hell no, nah, we ain't trying to see this communist effort. You know, they're going to be bringing Latino folks out here and none of the people at social services speak Spanish. And one lady, she lived on a 40 acre plot and she was like, yo, I don't want, uh, I want to be able to walk out of my property and not and know my neighbors. I'm like, yo, you ain't walking nowhere. You got 48 degrees. <laughs> ain't nowhere to go. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you gonna walk around your, car, your little circle of your, um, on your property and you be tired going in the house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the zoning kind of like blocked us, the idea of us doing multiple houses oh. on the property. Mm -hmm. So we had to reevaluate that and came up with the idea to do a bed and breakfast on the property to serve as a, uh, long-term, short-term stay for folks that are gonna be farming on the property. So we are at that stage of like site design and all that type of stuff about to launch the capital campaign for it. So this is the, uh, this is the land, or oh, this is just a portion of the drone shot that I got uh, of the land. Jerome, is that family still there? Yeah, so okay. uh, Callie lives next door. Okay. So okay. She, she, okay. she has her parcel and then right next door is the okay. 80 acres. Okay. 35 of it is under forest and now that's clear and flat. Um, so the Petersburg pro property though is um, the, the urban aspect and it's really, um, I, since I run the training program, I, I don't, I'm real big about not dangling carrots in front of people, you know what I mean? So I was like, yo, if you really want to do this, I'm going to train you, I'm going to give you all the, the, the insight, the patterns, the principles that you need in order to build soil fertility and all the whole shit, how to run your farm operation and even design it but if you really want to do it, we got this Petersburg property here that we're giving you a quarter acre to go ahead and get your action popping, right? Stay there for a year, three years, and if you really, you know, figure out how to, how to rock this, then we can get you over to the Amelia property where you can get three to five acres and really expand and scale up, you know what I mean? Um, so the, 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 the Petersburg property is, is uh, five acres, um, it's an educational space, it's an incubator farm. Um, right now we have four farmers that are on the property, uh, one of which is one of my former students and two others are other farmers that have been farming in the area and one guy that I just met through you know, him volunteering in, in, in the work. So everybody's got a lease, you know what I mean? We ain't asking people to pay. We'd be like, yo, all right, what, what's your skill? You know what I mean? Contribute your skill to the development of this project, and that's your payment for working the land. You know what I mean? And so it's going good so far. We got a coal bot on there, you know, community kitchen, you know, a tiny house for the chickens is, is, is dope. Um, so yeah, this is the land. So we own, we own from the street here all the way to the, uh, to the tree line at the back. And uh, it came with a greenhouse on it, um, well water. Uh, you know, it had been worked before, 
but you know we're, we're improving the soil on it and just kind of rocking out. So, um, can I ask you a question to clarify something? <coughs> yeah. Just so both properties are part of the west of the Central Virginia Agrarian Commons. Yes. Okay. Just want to. Yes, both properties yeah. are. Um, I've been trying to do the video thing. I never can get that shit right. So, anyway, it was a little video flyover drone thing, and you can see that on the website. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, you know, I throw this slide in here because it, it kind of breaks down our relationship. This is the part that is real for me. During George Floyd rebellions, everybody want to talk about being an ally, right? I say I love the fact that y'all want to take the class on racial justice and the DEI and all that type of stuff. You got a million definitions of equity, but when, it, when, it, when the rubber hits the road, what we talking about is transfer of capital and resources to black and brown communities. Yeah. If we ain't talking about that, we ain't really talking. We just <laughs> jibber jabbering, you know what I'm saying? It just sounds good. We all feel well, really well. We do the kumbaya circle, we hug and shit, and I'm still broke, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so what I loved about this Ex experience with the agrarian trust is like irrespective of, of whatever happened like we they came to me and said yo this is what we're gonna do and they did it you know what I mean and my energy has always been like yo I don't we can have a long-term relationship you know my mom always told me that people come into your life for a reason season you know what I'm saying so if they want to keep riding with us and we, you know we get this money we, we got to do in order to acquire more properties then boom let's go but if it stops Simply with the transfer of that 80 acres and the five acre purchase, totally good. We did what we came to do and we keep it moving. You know what I'm saying? As an organization, our work, it changed the game for us because we did our first conservation easement on the five acres. We did four of those five on a conservation easement. And as a social justice, social uh, justice organization, to be able to do that type of transaction and get, you know, 200 and a quarter of a million dollars infused into your organization that you could do whatever you need to do with is get I have a different conversation with philanthropy now because now I'm like yo I'm gonna do this anyway I would love for you to be a part of what we're already gonna do it's not like yo can you give me a grant or whatever hopefully let's build a relationship it's like nah this is going down we got the money would you like the match because we could do it faster that's the energy that we are able to calibrate now and then we also able to support you know, staff and their infrastructure needs. So, you know, the way that stuff flows, agrarian trust, they basically put us in front of the people with the money. You know what I mean? And then they put the money up where it needed to be put up, and then they helped us with the legal support. And those type of really tangible, practical applications is, you know, this, this is all, that's all we were saying during the whole thing. It's like, yo, we just need reparations. And that was a really clear form of reparations. Um, not gonna go into all that. Uh, the big picture cons cons considerations, okay, the CLT owns the land in perpetuity. So, so for folks that are looking to get equity in the land, this ain't the situation for you. You know what I mean? I gotta keep that on the front end with people. It's like, yo, this is like if you wanted to do uh, a CLT home, like a community land trust home, the community land trust purchases the land and then you, you know, you buy the house, the above ground improvements, you own that, you get the equity out of that. You know, this is great for your starter home. I had to break this shit down to people all the time, like this ain't the situation that you stay at for the rest of your life, you go ahead and get this, you know, if, you know, of course the property value is going to increase when you sell, you know, you split it and then, you know, you uh, go out and buy the thing that you really want. Cause you shouldn't have to always be underneath somebody. Um, but with this, it's like with the farmer, we have to explain it too. It's like, yo, this is, you know, we have a real real relationship with like sharecropping that's like, nah, I'm not trying to farm somebody else's land. I'm putting all this work into it. But we also have an experience with collective ownership that's necessary to reinforce, right? And build a muscle memory of what it means for us to work in common, right? And have a shared space that we're all you know accountable to and so um, with the farmers I'm like boom you know this is an incubator farm you know what I mean come over here you can do your thing if you want to do a 99 year lease let's go but if you only want to rock out here for a couple years while you get your issue in order you you know get your relationship established with the USDA you know got, got your farm track number you know you go ahead and start filing your schedule F and 
you know, you can document that you actually know how to farm and that you can access some of these other programs. This is the way to go where you ain't got to get a mortgage or a lease on a piece of property and be scrambling trying to figure out how you're going to pay your mortgage as well as get your, refine your practice. Because that's the big, you know, you step out here trying to farm, yo, you need a year. At least with no, that no, nobody that you got to pay so you can figure this shit out. You know what I'm saying? But um, so we basically offer that, offering that up uh, for folks. But the real conversation about equity is a challenge. Because, you know, it's like, yo, uh, how do we make sure that folks get their equity? So it's like on a farm, you can build whole barn or high tunnel or a greenhouse and shit like that. But, you know, how do people get equity out of that is a challenge. And then, of course, you know, irrespective of who you are, if you farm on land, you're building up the soil and, you know, you can take the soil with you when you go somewhere, <laughs> but that's a whole challenge by itself. So, you know, how do we make sure people, you know, feel good about that? Um, the other issue has been um, access to uh, capital for the above ground improvements. Uh, the conservation easement conversation kind of knocked that back for us as far as the Petersburg property. We're just waiting on the money now. Um, we did take out like some low interest, no interest loans to kind of get the work going. So that was cool based off the pledge. Um, the housing piece is still uh, a struggle. Um, so we kind of landed on glamping tents and, and, and things like that. I was just in the workshop where they like, hell nah, no glamping tents in New York. in the conservation easement. I was like, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to get the people on the land any other way. Like, you know, um, so we got to figure that out. Um, and then the most important is that this work ever, it's requ it has required, it's always required, but even more so now is requiring deep levels of trans transparency, you know, and, and trust building. You know, these are, this should sound like fifth, like fifth grade when we're talking to little kids, like, yeah, share, <laughs> tell the truth, be nice. You know what I'm saying? Like, that, like the, the stuff that you expect people to come to the space already knowing, we got to reiterate that shit because people don't be knowing. People come in and they're just thinking about themselves. Like, no, we are in a collective. We are together. So we can't do the toxic shit. You're trying to get five grand from the, from the philanthropy. You can't step on the other guy to get the five grand because then you mess up the ecosystem because people are... Anyway, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. That's my trauma <laughs> coming out. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, so I'm going to um, uh, close out. Uh, this is one project that we're working on, uh, but it's also, uh, we have numerous. This is the second. Uh, this is the Bensley Agrihood. So in, uh, this is not a project that I'm in collaboration with the Agrarian Trust with, but it's just another example of us taking ownership of land um, nine acres on the outskirts of Richmond. We're building a neighborhood, affordable housing, 10 uh, affordable homes, four tiny homes, a, a wellness center, and a farm as an amenity for, for the neighborhood. So um, this, this project is, is really dope. I'm excited about it um, because, you know, we already, we've already raised maybe like $2 million. You know, we got a uh, uh, USDA planning grant uh, last year, so we're in year one uh, of that, and um, you know we got some designs down for the farm and everything, so it's really rolling. It's, it's actually happening, and um, yeah, it's, it's 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 imperative for us to figure out how we do both of these things. I mean, I I reference New Communities Inc. You know all the time, and I have to explain to people like this is a Black liberation strategy. You know what I mean? The Community Land Trust movement. Oh, Shirley Sherrod and Charles Sherrod, an incredible debt because of the work that they've done down in Georgia. It laid the groundwork for what we're doing. Like, I mean, you might, you know, talk about other people and all these other things, but they were in the trenches in Georgia after the Civil Rights Act passes. They stayed in Georgia, you know what I mean? And it's a big part of the arc of justice for black and brown people. After the Voting Rights Act passes, everybody thinks everything was good. Everybody went home and it was, you know, we all sang Kumbaya, the fire was lit, you know, I mean, marshmallows and s'mores. But what you really find is that after that, black and brown community organizations were focusing on land, right? So you got Fannie Lou Hamer, right? And Freedom Farms Cooperative outside of Jackson, Mississippi. You got uh, Charles and Shirley Sherrod with New Communities, Inc. in Georgia. You got the Republic of New Africa. You have all of these organizations that are really clear 
that they that black people need space and autonomy to practice self determination, right? And that the policy stuff with the laws and everything was all was that work was to make sure that we were able to do these type things, you know. So um, yeah, I just just want to throw that in there as well. And um, yeah, that's my time. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kristen King-Reese. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the legal tools as part of this work. Um, I'm an attorney and I come to this work through affordable home ownership, uh, community land trust. And what got me really interested in, in doing it was um, learning about new communities about 10 years ago or so. And, um, and as Duran said, the way it was intended to solidify the gains of the social, I mean of the um, civil rights movement, and take those laws and turn them into practice. Um, but today I'm gonna talk, how many of you here are from um, Conservation Land Trust? Okay, lots of people. Um, so I want to talk to you about how you can use the power of conservation land trust to support the work that's happening here. And I'm going to do that by kind of outlining what the, the legal tools that conservation land trusts use versus the tools that CLTs use and sort of the overlap and how um, agrarian trust crea is creating a hybrid to make those two things uh, complement each other and and help the work. So most of you are probably way more familiar with conservation uh, tools than I am. And if you've been going to sessions uh, here at the rally, then you may have run into the uh, bundle of sticks. Has anybody run into the bundle of sticks yet? <laughs> Do you feel like you're being hit over the head by <laughs> Well, so I have a plant in the audience. Um, Conrad Legal, who is a tax expert and just an extraordinary human being, has been very helpful to Agrarian Trust and to myself and Fran doing this work. Um, and I'm gonna call on him to explain what the, the main legal tool is for Conservation Land Trust. Just so we're well, the, the main tool that um, you know, if land trusts can't acquire the land out, outright, uh, then they um, acquire a conservation easement over the land to protect its uh, conservation values, as all of you know, or most of you know, and that that is a, a deed against the land that's recorded that basically have a set of restrictions that protect those conservation values. And as a land trust, uh, you administer that conservation easement by monitoring the land uh, and, if necessary, enforcing those restrictions. So that's the basics. OK, great. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, and typically, I mean, do the land trusts, do the folks who work for land trusts who are here, um, do your land trusts like to acquire land, or they, do they prefer to hold easements on land? Who, who acquires land? Oh, okay. Try. That's okay. That's, um, I'm, I don't know, I'm out west and I'm more familiar with just acquiring the easements. Um, but, okay. So community land trusts operate quite differently in many ways. And I'm not gonna read this slide because you can. Um, and to Duran's point about shared equity, it's not for everybody. And you, ha yeah, you got to be really clear about that from the start, um, because you're not going to own the land in a sort of traditional market rate way. You are going to just own the improvements, and you are going to have really limited, not really limited, but limited return um, on your investment. And it is one approach of many, and there have been some really, I've been learning about some other exciting ways that people are doing this work for um, farmland at this conference. 
The CLT model is a... Let's turn that off on this Try again. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm so used to presenting online now. This feels really... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. The model is a flex it's a very flexible tool. It's people focused. Um, it you have to be income qualified, meaning it serves as people making a certain amount of money. And it is a starter tool. It is not if you can buy market rate land and housing, then that would be my advice as your attorney to do so. Um, but if you can't if you want to be able to move out of this rental, this perpetual rental cycle, um, this is a way to do it. And um, one of the things that I love about the CLT model that's quite different from other affordable housing programs is the income qualification happen one, happens once. When you buy your house, like at closing, whatever you're making, if you fit within this window, then you're good. And then the next day you win the lottery, you still are good. You do not have to leave your home. You don't have to change anything. And I think that's why it's such a powerful tool for building wealth and just helping people in general improve health. Um. Okay, but so it's not just for housing and one of, and. So when the new communities was besieged, uh, the CLT model ended up moving away from farmland, and, which I think is a tragedy, but also quite understandable. And so for many years, it's really been in urban areas and focused on housing. But it can use, it can be used for any number of purposes, um, including farmland. Here are some of the key structural elements. So they're typically nonprofit. They can be government programs, can be part of Habitat for Humanity, but the classic CLT is a nonprofit. Um, I like to get into the weeds on things. I just want to take the temperature of the room. <laughs> is, does anybody want to know about deed restricted programs that governments? Okay, we, we can talk later. Because um, I have this whole paragraph on it, but I will, I will spare you. Um, Do you have like a sentence to like tease it? I'm sorry? Do you have like a sentence to tease it? A sentence? It? Okay. I think there's some great things about governments, um, you know, helping provide uh, affordable home ownership. However, there are a lot of issues and politics plays a big role. And so if you have one administration that's all behind it uh, and the next administration doesn't care or p ignores it, then there are some horror stories. And so uh, I prefer the community land trust model plus just stewardship and all that kind of stuff. Also, that gets me to my next thing, which is board governance. At least one third of your board needs to be homeowners <laughs> and who are lessees. So, meaning uh, nothing about us without us. You have people who are on the board, um, you know, helping inform how the ground lease works, what the decisions are, and how they're going to use the money. Um, and in a, in a city situation or a municipal situation, that doesn't happen. Um, the, the big legal mechanism that we're going to talk about in a second is um, primarily the ground lease. And that um, governs the relationship between the two parties. Long-term stewardship is also a great thing about community land trusts. Um, it starts with homeowner education and helping people understand mortgages, what's a predatory mortgage, how to avoid that. And then it goes from there to help, <coughs> excuse me, help with purchasing your home. Um, if you have issues when you own your home, like if you run into financial trouble, I always advise people to lean on their CLT. Uh, there's a lot of expertise there. 
And if you find yourself unable to pay your lease fees or, you know, God forbid, your mortgage, then talk to, those, talk to the folks who are doing stewardship and ask them to help you. They can't miraculously pay your mortgage, but they can help negotiate with the banks. And worst case scenario, they can arrange a short sale. So you're good. Oh, equity. Building equity. I have a chart for this too, if anybody wants one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because it, it looks, when you look at it on paper, it's like, oh, you're not going to make very much money at all. It's interest on top of you know, whatever you put down, and that's that's the limited, that's the equity you get back. And it sounds bad. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, I was uh, not sold at first, but when you look at the money you would be spending on rent, that's where the vein is. Rent goes, you know, into the toilet. You never see it again. It doesn't help you with your taxes. It doesn't, you know, so, if you look at how much you pay in rent every year and um, realize that you're going to be getting some of that, most of that back through your mortgage, then it makes a huge difference and that's how people are able to go from CLT home ownership to market rate home ownership. And the last statistics on that was six out of ten homeowners, uh, CLT homeowners were bought into the market rate housing. Um, and that, you know, there are plenty of people who buy their home and decide this is where they want to stay. Um, I think now with the crazy markets, I don't want to see the numbers actually. I think it's, it's tough right now. But the legal tool for um, CLTs is that bundle of sticks. You separate the land from the improvements. So the stick that comes out for the CLT homeowner is whatever it is the improvement is that sits on top of the land. And you create two different deeds and that's how and you're able to get to be qualified for a mortgage. Fannie and Freddie are on board with this, so um, the ground lease has these um, affordability restrictions, which I kind of mentioned already. Um, but resale is a big one. Also, not being able to rent it as a VRBO or Airbnb. Um, so, all right, I'm just gonna do a quick overview. CLT acquires farmland. This is how it can be used, and this is what the Agrarian Trust is looking at and has done some of. Um, CLT acquires the farmland, or the Agrarian Commons acquires it. Farmer enters into a long-term below-market ground lease, and the way that they get away with have, giving um, these below-market leases is by having people be income qualified. So that's, that fits the mission. Um, which is to serve people in this range of low and moderate income. Can you avoid private benefit? Yes. Right. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Um, and then, and this is the piece that's kind of sticky. We don't know about um, well, how the equity is going to be grown on the farms. And Duran alluded to that. And as somebody coming out of the CLT world, I'm all about having it be ownership of improvements. I just think it's one of the easier ways to do it. Um, what I learned is that a lot of conservation land trusts, or not a lot, but some easements explicitly disallow the separation of land from improvements, which I, does anybody understand why that, <laughs> now that I'm in this room with all these people who are experts, anybody know? I, I mean, in, in the easements that I've worked with, I mean, it's considered a subdivision to, to take the land from the structure. Okay. And I guess it's reducing the number of individuals who are involved. I, don't, I mean, I don't know the that makes sense. origin, but I know in the easements I've looked at, they consider it a subdivision. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So. Um, what you know? What I wanted to talk to you about today is 
where do these two tools kind of overlap and where are they different? And how can you as people in the conservation land trust world bring your voices and your skills and your um, influence to bear on this work? Um, so you can see uh, habitat, wildlife, conservation, have I missed anything? <laughs> okay. CLTs. Farming. 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 Oh, sorry. I'm going to add that to my slide. Thank you. Um, and then on the other side, there's typically it's affordable housing. Sometimes it's commercial buildings and other uh, public spaces and equity building. Um, you know, and as I've mentioned, this CLT is more uh, people as part of nature um, and then more as um, interested in flexibility and has possibly more tools. There's democratic governance and it's very place-based. Um, but the shared missions are, anybody want to take a guess? Taking land out of the market? Mm. Yes, decommodifying land, exactly. And um, so conserving land in perpetuity. Part of that means getting, you know, removing the development rights, and they use different ways of doing it. Um, and valuing land over profit, understanding that the land is not fungible, it is not something that you can, you know, it's not a stock, and this financialization of farmland is, to me, quite terrifying, because you can't, I, I mean, it doesn't make any sense, um, and it's a real threat to the food system in this country. There is, okay, the shared approaches that I want to focus on are, Shared sense of urgency. You know, conservation land trusts often run into this situation where they have to do move immediately. Uh, somebody comes in and tells you there's this amazing piece of land and it's going to be turned into a subdivision and you have to act really fast. Um, same thing for, um, for a, a farm, uh, an agrarian commons. Also, these are both funded by a mix of private and public money for community benefit, and not everybody understands that, so there's pushback from people about why do you get to have this money, and it doesn't go, you know, it's not an open park, it's not for everyone to use. Um, there's a voluntary approach versus regulatory approach, which both of these models use, meaning that you work with people who want to be doing this work rather than people who are, have been ordered to do this work or are required to do this work. There are existing legal structures that can be adapted to make it work. Um, it's, in the case of community land trusts especially, it's pretty clunky, actually. There's a lot of, um, I don't know, hacking the law to try to make it fit. But, uh, and when that falls apart and doesn't work at all, then we advocate for changes to the law. So there's a lot of advocacy. Oh, do I have to, <laughs> I gotta wrap it up. <laughs> okay, there's a, some materials from yesterday's presentation on housing and farming that apparently are fabulous. I was not able to be at that, but um, they have, a number of examples of really wonderful partnerships between community land trusts and conservation land trusts. So if that's something that you want to know about, I would try to look at those materials. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's my last slide. Okay, the, the hybrid. Um, trying to bring these tools together to conserve farmland in a way that is sustainable and healthy and good for the environment, to restrict development or uh, in some cases not allow it at all, to take it out of the market, decommodify it, and to respond to displacement for uh, uh, black and brown farmers and people who have just faced not just historic but ongoing discrimination. All right, unifying threads. 
Uh, oh, the agrarian commons, we are not, you know, as Fran said, we're just, uh, we're evolving. And Duran mentioned that as well. And the C2, as we went along, we learned that it's incredibly limited. So there's a whole menu of, of legal entities that we're working on um, to see if those would work better. Um, but the threads that are unifying is long-term secure leases for farmers, ecological stewardship agreements, opportunities to build wealth, and direct community involvement and control. Okay, and I'm gonna hand it back over to Fran. Thanks for listening. staff person here so I'm gonna keep this brief and mostly use the rest of this time for um, everybody to have some conversations with these super smart people um, but I did want to thank you all for being here in this conservation space to talk about what it might look like to use um, the privilege that a lot of our organizations have to get capital and to build these connections to legal resources um, for farmers to access land, specifically um, reparative justice organizations. And so, yeah, I want to mostly have this space be for questions, but um, I did want to just say, I guess, that Agrarian Trust's role in this ecosystem is evolving, and we're at an exciting point right now where we're really thinking about what it means to show up as a national organization that has certain kinds of privilege and capital. We just got this really big USDA grant, um, and we just have this visibility that a lot of local organizations, and especially BIPOC organizations, don't always have access to. Um, and so we're really in this like listening and learning phase right now of like how do the kinds of support that we provide evolve, um, and how do we really listen uh, to what people are asking for. So yeah, with that said, um, we've got, I think, 20 minutes or so here for questions, and I know we really want to have good conversations with all of you, so I'm gonna, yeah, I guess I can pass the mic around, or it's a small enough room, maybe you could just speak, speak up. up. Yeah, just speak up, okay. Um, so my question, um, you know, I have, I came in late, so maybe you covered this at the very beginning, so if you did, I'm sorry. Um, one of the big barriers